Thank you all for coming. So before I begin my talk that centers on imperialism and its violences, I'd like to acknowledge that we stand on traditional and unceded territory of the Piscataway and Piscataway Kanoe people. And second, I owe incredible gratitude to Shireen Durrani, the center here, Professor Brown in particular, and everyone else who does work behind the scenes that I did not see or hear of. Today I'm talking about the 1857-1858 rebellion in India, and specifically how the Great Rebellion was written, how writing it rewrote Muslim, and how those definitions matter. So, spoilers, here's the thesis of this talk. After the rebellion, Muslim and jihadi became elided and interchangeable. The memorialization and writing of rebellion not only marginalized Muslims, but also obscured complex <coughs> cultures of North India. Not by the bisyncretic <coughs> cultures, but composite ones. The 1857-1858 rebellion called into question literary, social, and religious cultures over and above any political upheaval and changes sought therein. The rebellion also fundamentally changed what it meant to be a Muslim in North India. Authorities established the Muslims as a threat. Britons and Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs, as, where, as well as others, responded to that threat. So what I'm trying to talk about today is how the rebellion marked Muslims as jihadi due to a, pro a process of racialization, minoritization. If I do this right, I will, rather quickly, walk us through how accountings of and responses to the rebellion created an historic discursive shift that sets up racialized patterns we still see today and what that means as we think about the future of this project or the future of this work or why study history, what's the, what's the impact? In short, here's my plan. I'm a good historian. I like plans with these statements where you can follow along. So here's my plan. Establish why I think we need a deeper read on the rebellion. Think about racialization, minoritization, and Muslims. Offer some evidence that the rebellion lingers as a touchstone of racialized religious identities and conclude with a few thoughts on how and why my project might help us continue to think about Islamophobia, anti-Muslim rhetoric, even across the ocean, even today. So, because I cannot sequester you all afternoon, here are two premises that I'm happy to discuss more in a Q&A, but that I ask that you take as a given. First, that a discursive shift happened. I spent the first half of my book talking about this. I promise uh, we can, I can send you scans of it. Um, it happened. Believe me. Before 1857, Muslims may have been imagined as violent or warlike and sometimes fanatical, but not in terms of religious obligation, which is to say that authors, both European and South Asian, do not dwell on the term jihad and its legal obligation in any significant way. However, both immediately and in the decade or so following the rebellion, jihad became a central concern for both European and South Asian authors. So our first given is that stereotypes exist before 1857, but they are transformed discursively into legally binding, scientifically provable, immutable facts about Muslims <laughs> afterwards. And second, my second given, and it's related, is that because of imperialism, flows of power and information, a simultaneous fixation <coughs> on race, the shift from stereotype to scientific fact had real and global consequences. So my second given is that today's talk reflects a local and global history at once, and a history that's still unfolding. All right, now that I've done the business of it, let's jump in and examine an image. So you can tell I teach a lot of undergraduates. We're gonna have a little bit of an interactive session. One, I think this, I think this image encapsulates a lot of what I'm trying to talk about neatly. It is Francis Bieto's 1858 photograph, which documents a mosque in Beirut a city in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. This is a simple enough lithograph of an architectural landscape. This is what Beto's published and widely circulated lithograph series are known for. He had been hired by the British Empire in a number of different locations and a number of different times. This is the stuff he's known for. What makes this image remarkable is its original title, which suggests it is not merely a mosque, but rather a space for rebels. It reads, quote, a mosque in Beirut where some of the rebel soldiers may have prayed. This is a half sentence, one clause, and the mosque and its absent Muslims who prayed within it are marked. 
in both the photograph and in our interpretations of 150 plus years later as part of the religious landscape from which brutal uprisings grew. So as far as we know, there's no real evidence for Beato's caption. There isn't a log of this particular mosque as one that actually held rebels in East India records. There aren't other supporting eyewitness accounts that corroborate Beato's insistence. There aren't South Asian accounts in Hindi, Urdu, Sindhi, or English that suggest this mosque was more than a mosque, or I suppose less than a mosque, depending on your gloss of this. Beato's caption itself is less than committal, right? It, it may have been a rebel, a, a, a place where some rebel soldiers pray. But this caption is also telling, because despite its obvious problems, any of us can poke holes at why this is a problem, it persists. This is the title of the caption that is replicated in secondary English literature um, in increasing ways in the past 50 so years. I tried to count all the places it's listed. I've come up with like 207 places. It's replicated in every iteration of its digital life via Wikicommons, Hathi Trust, and other digital repositories. So its repetition, availability, and prominence all lend authority to this claim. Beato's Mayroot Mosque has become the definitive image of a mosque that may have held Muslims, but not, not Muslims, but rebels. So that transformation is really palpable in this one image. So lest you think that this is just a teaching exercise and I couldn't possibly parse this even further, let me keep boring you. I'm dwelling because I can and because the marking of this mosque by a European man, not just as a mosque, but as something more and something more sinister than that, so readily demonstrates the ways that writing rebellion wrote Muslim identification. Beato took a photograph of a mosque in 1858. He assumed the mosque's proximity to one of the earliest and notably bloody revolts of the previous year's war <coughs> indicated significance, as his caption indicates. He may not have been wrong. Certainly mosques, as well as other sacred sites in North India, were used as shelter during raids and warfare before and after 1857. But whether this particular mosque was used in this particular instance of revolt isn't clear to me or other historians. What is clear is that a photographer and witness to some of the rebellion had no trouble labeling it, classifying it, as a mosque come safe haven for the dangerous, seditious Muslim rebels. In other words, this image and its assumed truths tell us all we need to know about religiosity and revolt. They are linked, they are linked to Islam, they are linked to the events of the rebellion. And it does so within a veil of objectivity, a European observer's documentary evidence. The medium is in some ways as important as the image. Let us not discount the work that a photograph accomplishes as a new technology primed to show us reality in black and white through scientific means. Those familiar, those unfamiliar with what Be Beato may have witnessed, three days in May of 1857 set off a long and terrifying period of bloodshed, rebellion, suppression, and suspicion. On May 9th of 1857, Sepoys, derived from Sipahi, Indian soldiers, serving in the 3rd Regiment of the Light Cavalry in Beirut, India Cantonment, awaited imprisonment for failing to use their new weapons properly. The latest Lee Enfield rifles required Sepoys to bite its cartridge in order to load the weapon, and they refused to do it, direct, uh, disobeying direct orders. They had heard rumors about these new rifles. The cartridges were greased with lard and tallow. Animal products respectively forbidden the Muslim and Hindu soldiers alike. This was the last draw after months of growing unrest, and these rumors sparked the match that lit the flame of mutiny and rebellion. On May 10th of 1857, as sepoys of the 3rd Regiment faced sentencing, other regiments in Beirut broke rank to liberate their imprisoned compatriots forcefully. This was a fierce and bloody internal attack, but the violence was not limited to the garrison walls and Beirut civilians were not spared. Some 20 British and some 50 Indian civilians, including notably women and children, were massacred. Many Sepoys fled to Delhi, some 40 miles away, during the night, and then the next day on May 11th, Delhi also witnessed rebellion. Fighting spreads to major strongholds in cities like Kanpur and Lucknow, and sooner <coughs> than later, uh, historians argue within seven days, we have full-blown revolt. So these three initial days and four cities were just the beginning of this year-long and wide area of involvement that continue to mark one of the most important events in South Asian and British history alike. 
And while, I don't know how well you can see this, but there are red underlines under most of those cities, and those red underlines are where revolt happened. While there are many lesser known examples of Indic resistance, the centrality of 1857 remains in Euro-American and South Asian historiographies. Perhaps it's overvalued as the example of Indian resistance, yet the Great Rebellion is undeniably an exemplar of resistance. And moreover, an indelible set of events which fundamentally altered the ways in which India was ruled. So just because we don't learn about this in America doesn't mean it's not important. There's also little doubt that as important as the rebellion is to the study of history or to the nation states that, that write that history, it also fundamentally de alters definitions of religion. It is quite simply the case that no scholar of religion can afford to ignore South Asia. Not only do so many of the field's founding thinkers base their theories on Indic languages, literatures, racial linguistic definitions, but as others have argued, and here I'm thinking of Peter Gottschalk, um, South Asia was the physical and imagined location for the categorization of religion, which alters how religion is thought about well beyond India or British rule. It changes how we teach religion in departments like mine, for example. In short, I'm trying to argue that the Great Rebellion seismically reconfigures the way in both religion as a concept and particular religions are defined and classified. So we need to care about this for theoretical reasons as well as historical reasons. Specifically, one commentator, religion as a motivating factor is really important here. One commentator remarks, quote, religion is not a thing to be trifled with, and the dullest and most phlegmatic will be roused to the boiling point of rage and enthusiasm when it is once affected. Just some, I like love the 19th century, it's great, right? Like these quotes are fabulous. British observers and officials were not equally concerned by all religions, however. Not all religions appeared to contain the possibility of boiling rage. British observers and officials saw Muslims and Islam as uniquely susceptible to violence due to religious offense, obligation, and sentiment. The rebellion marks a dramatic moment in which Muslims come to be both minoritized and racialized, terms I'm going to get to in a second. Just as one cannot understand the history of the study of religion without navigating how India has been portrayed, neither can one comprehend a contemporary racialized relationship between Muslims and Jihad without first locating its historical correlation to these events. So what do I mean by minoritization and racialization? Minoritization should not be confused with demographic minority. It is instead the systemic process by which elites deny access to a group through an implementation of power broadly defined. Minoritization is a process, and in the example of the 1857 rebellion, a process of the consolidation of British power over Muslim elites and the religious, constituen the religious constituency they supposedly represent. This was achieved by both de jure and de facto shifts that included, as some like peppered examples, the discontinuation of Islamicate and Indic languages in official settings, real and perceived mistreatment of Muslims, which include like stealing children from their parents and raising them in Christian orphanages so that they would be ro raised up with the right sort of religion. Minoritization stripped power from those who previously held it, signaling a disenfranchisement, loss of privilege, and perceived loss of protection. Where minoritization collapses a complex group or groups into a singularity and seeks to marginalize that group, racialization marks individuals as having immutable traits because of their membership or assumed membership in a particular group. The concept and construct of race includes essentialization of groups based upon traits imagined to be inherent hereditary and prognostic. That is to say, rooted in pseudobiology and therefore scientifically real. Racialization is the process through which individuals are made manifest as both belonging to a cogent group, as well as possessing those inherent hereditary and prognostic characteristics. Religions are not races. Islam is not a race, but Islam and its practitioners are racialized. After the rebellion, Muslims in India are portrayed as inherently seditious, bound by both law and intrinsic disposition to violence, and necessarily ill-tempered, incorrigible, and unable to be ruled by non-Muslims. They're depicted as possessing inherent, unchanging, transmittable characteristics. These are decidedly racialized. Muslims cannot escape these traits. They are imagined to be part of the fundamental composition of what and who is Muslim. To be otherwise, in effect, would indicate that one is not Muslim, 
an accusation and implication we often see in the primary sources and one that I'll dig up for us later on. Racialization and minoritization do not function solely as external labels thrust upon Europe's others. Instead, they often demand and require the participation of those who have been racialized and minoritized. These are pernicious systems of power, definition, classification, and with respect to Indian Muslims, they relied on stories told about the Great Rebellion. Like I said before, before the rebellion, Muslim may have been portrayed as violent, prone to fanaticism, but the rebellion triggers definitions of Muslims where religious violence and inheritable fanaticism were nearly inescapable. The rebellion, as observers would write, posed a fundamental question about Muslims. Did Muslims belong to or in British India at all? Minoritization and racialization are at the heart of the question of this question about Muslim belonging. So in the book from which this talk is drawn, I critically and primarily engage with two authors invested in this question. <clears throat> One is W.W. W. Hunter, the Indian, um, his book is called The Indian Muslims: Are They Bound in Conscience to Rebel Against the Queen? It's a great subtitle. And he resoundingly answers, yeah, yes, indeed. Muslims are bound in conscience to rebel against the queen and therefore were a distinct problem to be solved by the British ruling elite. The other texts that I worked with were um, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, who had previously written about the rebellion in Causes of the Indian Rebellion, um, as Babi Bhagwati Hind, but he also- Dr. Heard. Hall's book, sorry. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought props. I didn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, his review of Dr. Hunter's Indian Muslims, Are They Bound in Conscience to Rebel Against the Queen? In both of these pieces, and especially in his review, Khan's defensive writing about the rebellion demonstrates a minoritized and racialized Muslim community distinctively and uniquely held accountable for the violence of revolt. This exchange, though it's a limited exchange, serves to demonstrate discursive minoritization and racialization, and how those processes become hegemons against which Muslims too must struggle to be defined. So in other words, while Britons la asked and demanded answers to the so-called Muslim question, Muslims engaging in this discourse similarly perpetuate the idea that Muslims stand as a unique, cogent group. So thus they participate, albeit asymmetrically, in the process of definition, racialization, and minoritization. So the classification of religion, especially Islam and Hinduism, came to be a hallmark of the British Empire. On the whole, Britons, despite statistical data and often personal experience, were convinced of the, quote, essentially religious character of Indians and the mutual exclusivity between Hindu and Muslim communities, as Peter Gottschalk like, really neatly puts it. The Imperial Project in India instantiated a classificatory system in which religion was the operative category. The import of this category, the stress on differences between and among Indians on a basis of religion, is most evident during this rebellion. Muslims were not Hindus, in part on the basis of belief and practice, but ultimately on the imperial delineation of inborn characteristics that demarcated and separated these groups intrinsically. So I want, I want to keep coming back to these phrases, transmittability, inheritability, inborn, prognostic. This should all sound some like <coughs> basic racialization, if not straight up racism. But I want to come back to and really dive into the narratives of, um, of how Islam is being portrayed within the Great Rebellion, now that we've done some of our theory. There are really countless examples to be had here. Beato's Photograph stands as one, as does Hunter's quote behind or to the side of me, for example. But for clarity, I want to focus on one example for the rest of this talk, the debate about whether or not jihad was permitted against the British. More specifically, let's focus on what came to be known as the Calcutta Fatwa, a ruling that declared jihad was not permissible, but that British observers routinely dismissed, or I find worse, used as evidence that even if a few Muslims could prove themselves the masses could not due to their inborn fanaticism. So the Calcutta Fatwa came to represent the opposite of what it stated. Muslims were indeed bound and altogether likely to rebel against the queen, and I'm arguing because of the logics of racialization and minoritization. 
In November of 1870, in response to inflammatory newspaper <laughs> articles, ongoing accusations of sedition, a general climate of suspicion, the Mohammedan Liter Literary Society of Calcutta asked Maui Karmat Ali, a Hanafi jurist, to offer a ruling on whether Muslims were required by religious law to rebel against the queen. The Mohammedan Literary Society was an elite group of Muslims, and its founder, and its November 1870 meeting host to boot, Mal um, Maui Abdul Latif, this guy over here, was a noted intellectual, a known modernizer, he describes himself as a modernizer in a few places, and a general well-respected guy within Muslim and British circles of the time. He beseeches Karmat Ali uh, of this, this question, whether or not Muslims are required to rebel, and Karmat Ali rules that, quote, according to Mohammedan law, British India is Darul Islam, and that it is not lawful for the Mohammedans of British India to make jihad, end quote. Karmat Ali all added that, quote, ignorant Mohammedans had posed the question, and he was only answering it at some lengthy insistence by the Mohammedan Literary Society and our friend Abdul Latif over here. So despite rejecting the question out of hand, he proceeds to also outline that how the threshold for jihad had not been met legally. Hunter, right, writing in the following year, was well aware of this particular ruling. It was published as a pamphlet in both Urdu and English, and it was but one of a few that had been issued around and in the decade following the rebellions. There's a lot of these fatwas that come out. Hunter addressed the Calcutta fatwa directly, though. One would think a group loyal to the British, known in British circles, some of its members were even knighted and um, part and fought on behalf of the British during the rebellion, you would think that this would offer a solid and official ruling supporting British India and that it would be welcomed. It was not. Instead, Hunter argued, quote, it would be political blunder for us to accept without inquiry the views of the Mohammedan Literary Society of Calcutta as those of the Indian Muslims. So there's some interesting intellectual gymnastics happening here. Let's unpack it. While Hunter went on and on about this fatwa, I mean, I think it's 60 pages of this text, um, and the ways in which it's incorrect, this particular line, I think, gets at the heart of how racialization and minoritization are functioning. The Mohammedan Literary Society conducted public meetings, usually in Urdu, but with some regularity in English, to discuss a great range of literatures in Urdu, Persian, Arabic, and English. Sometimes they did Shakespeare, right? Like, this is a pretty standard literary society. Its membership was necessarily elite, they're literate, they have money, they're often deeply connected to multiple streams of power in northern India in the mid-19th century, which is to say, like, past connections to the Mughals, current connections to the, Indi um, to the East India Company, possible ties to the Ulama, ties to Calcutta and financial, political, social elites, you name it, these guys are hooked up. But... Hunter dismisses this ruling, first by attacking the legitimacy of its claims, and later, as we see here, by suggesting it folly to conflate these Muslims with Indian Muslims. He implies here, and he later states outwardly, that elite Muslims are decidedly not real Muslims. They do not count in the pool of Indian Muslims. For Hunter, Indian Muslims are zealous and violent by nature. The fanatical masses, as he refers to them, that term shows up 101 times in his text, will pay no mind to the Mohammedan Literary Society or its fatwa. In a clause, elite, learned, loyal Muslims, the very Muslims who, clear them, who see themselves as respectable answers to the so-called Muslim question, are dismissed as fundamentally not authentic Muslims. So to be Muslim, in Hunter's view, is to be seditious. And evidence to the contrary doesn't stand to prove that Muslims are loyal, but rather that these folks are somehow less Muslim, maybe not Muslim at all, diet Muslim, Muslim light. This fatwa, sought as salve to an untenable political climate, instead rendered its seekers something other than what they started. In Hunter's argument, their inherent untrustworthiness, that they seem to be Muslims but in fact cannot be, stands to uphold the status quo, that all Muslims are in fact the seditious type. Right? The exception proves the rule rather than changes it. Here's another example of what I mean. Hunter's work investigated the effects of zealotry on the masses. So he writes, I propose, therefore, to scrutinize the Sunni decisions with a view to ascertaining the effects 
which they will have on the more zealous Mohammedans, men with whom the sense of religious duty is rule of life, and whose minds are uninfluenced either by fear or danger or by habits of prosperous ease. For it is no use shutting our eyes to the fact that a larger proportion of our Mohammedan subjects belong to this class. So the majority for him are fanatics. Their religious duties, he argues, rule their lives unencumbered by fear or danger or even by prosperity. This is how Hunter answered the motives and the authenticity of elite Muslims who procured a ruling that appeared to favor what he wanted, British rule. Throwing this favorable ruling aside, their elite status and their prosperous ease does not guard against the inherent zealotry of their co-religionists. And it stands to reason that should these elite lose their prosperity, which is this process of minoritization, they should regain their inherent seditious zealotry. So the Mohammedan Literary Society plays a willing role in carving definitions of authentic Islam. Perhaps unwillingly, their attempts at demonstrating that real Islam were used in ways they couldn't have anticipated, ways that solidified the very racialized image they were working against. Similarly, I found Sir Syed Ahmed Khan to fill this space, and that's why he's the second subject of our, of our little chat here. That Khan stridently disagrees with Hunter should not surprise us, but his writing is all the more fascinating and noteworthy because Hunter's argument is that people like Khan shouldn't and might not exist. Or, according to Hunter, if such Muslims exist, they merely inhabit a minority class of Muslims morally and financially above the majoritarian rebellious counterparts and are politically inconsequential. Hunter expressly denied the veracity of the very proof text that Khan relies upon. Their debate, right, so Khan writes Indian Muslims, uh, Hunter writes Indian Muslims, Khan writes the review of it. They're both circulated widely in serial form throughout um, North Indian newspapers and, and London newspapers. So this debate is a one-sided argument where Hunter set the parameters and Khan merely participated within those boundaries. His reply, Sir Syed's reply that is, echoed in certain communities, English and Indian, Christian and Muslim, challenging depictions of jihad or jihadis as solely representing their identity as persons of faith racially identified subjects, and as members of a local and increasingly political milieu. So this text is important. It's not just a book review. It's an awesome critique. It's a play-by-play. -play. It's a really great polemic. I totally suggest reading it. But his most withering critique was reserved for Hunter's assertions that Muslims ought to be understood as seditious and disloyal. He includes a lengthy quote in which Hunter claimed that fanatical Muslims engaged in overt sedition, but that the quote, whole Mohammedan community has been openly deliberating on their objection, on their obligation to rebel for years, end quote. He followed the decidation with this admonishment, retorting, quote, now I have no hesitation in saying that this is one of the most unjust, illiberal, and insulting sentences ever penned against my co-religionists. His analysis of Hunter's inferences about rebellion centered on his misread of plurality, nuance, and as we might say today, diversity in belief, population, legal analysis. Khan ably punctures Hunter's arguments of totality, which despite Hunter's careful research, typifies the conclusions of Indian Muslims. The Muslims he envisioned and produced in that work were categorically and definitionally treasonous. But Khan also reifies these definitions. He says, it is not expected, it is not to be expected of Mohammedans, it is not to be expected that Mohammedans, who are made of much sterner material than Hindus, will adapt themselves so readily to the various phrases of the phases of this changing age. So like Hunter, Sir Syed sees Muslims as a distinctive group with categorical identity traits, stern or at least sterner than their Hindu counterparts. Khan sees his fellow Muslims as naturally less willing or able to adapt to British rule. There are a ton more examples to be had, but I'd like to take a breath for a moment and restate the point of what I'm trying to get at. Khan stands to demonstrate that the sort of Muslim Hunter believes to be so unrepresentative of the fanatical masses is in fact Muslim and Indian. So we buy that Sir Syed is an Indian Muslim, yes? Good. We also know that Khan systemically, point by point, undoes Hunter's argument. We have here a voice that is at once playing into a certain respectability politic, as we might say today, while offering well-read, well-circulated criticism of a major British figure and his widely held, widely trusted, governmental-sponsored pronouncements. But we still are left with the process of minoritization and racialization, 
both of which her side is not able to escape, as a man, personally, and as an author whose, write whose writings continue on. He's minoritized precisely because while he might have experienced a more powerful position of years prior, or men like him may have, he's already arguing from a defensive, apologetic position, what Faisal Devji called uh, an apologetic modernity. He finds himself without the same status, even as he maintains a significant and lasting position of power. He's racialized and participates in racialization because after 1857, this imperial understanding of jihad linked and reduced Muslim actors and Muslim organizations to rebellion and violence. Even Muslims like him knighted for their heroism during the rebellion. They both deploy jihad in ways that encapsulate this battle to define post-religion, post-rebellion South Asian landscape. Most relevantly, the definitions of Muslim and Islam. Both participated in a discourse that served to produce Muslims as minoritized and racialized, even if they disagree with each other. The fact remains that after the rebellion, one could not talk about subjecthood of Muslims without talking about jihad. So finally, let me kind of sum up what I think the point is here. This is the bit where we're looking ahead a little bit. The rebellion matters on a global scale, not because I'm telling you it mattered or because I'm hoping that this event seems big because I've spent, you know, five or six years on it, but because it was a sensational and sensationalized event that captured a global imagination. Karl Marx writes about it in newspapers that circulate globally. It is, it signals a previously unthought possibility of massive loss, not in the case of the United States, where one white Christian army comprised of defectors and long-standing political enemies, right? But of the colonized, these brown, multi-religious, decidedly not Christian folk. High atop this list of terrifying circumstances for the British was the notion of a realized Muslim world, something that historian Jamil Aden has written really brilliantly about recently. A realized Muslim world order was a thing in which Indians could participate receive funding from, and most alarmingly for the British, rally other Muslims to overthrow the British in their locales. Hunter's text supposedly addressed Indian Muslims, that's his title, right? But it's riddled with so-called evidence from everywhere and anywhere else, ranging from the Arabian Peninsula to Persia to North Africa to the Afghan borderlands to the Indian subcontinent. Sir Syed replies in kind a global set of evidences to prove the global identity and character of Indian Muslims belies both a fear of and implicit calling upon a universal Muslim or a universally accessible Muslim world. These terms and characteristics, jihad, trustworthiness, ability to belong to a nation state or empire, Muslim world, still carry meaning and they still inform racialized understandings of Muslims. So part of what I wanted, a part of what Dr. Brown asked me to talk about was how does this actually fit into the center's goals and how, when I think about this, does this affect today's kinds of climates globally? And so I have two thoughts and I hope you'll pick up on some of these threads later on. First, an easy one, how we imagine and remember the past are integral to how we imagine and chart our futures. Can we hear echoes of the rebellion in how we tie violence to Islam, imagine Muslims as a cogent whole, talk of the Muslim world in common parlance and in foreign policy across these divides that we know Muslims have between language, nationality, ethnicity, race, geography, ritual and theological practice, gender identities, class, ability, and of course, time. Can we imagine how the fact that Muslims are racialized is real, dangerous, and omnipresent reality in 2019? And can we think about that as related to essays penned in the aftermath of some of one of the 19th century's most important and bloody anti-colonial movements? Can we envision how not teaching this event in American and Canadian, I checked, curricula feeds into still unfolding ideas about Indians, Indian Muslims? Can we imagine how the politics of naming the rebellion a mutiny as it's taught in England, or the first war of independence as it's taught in India, refigures not just the past, but the future of those nation states. Thinking about how we got here and where this trajectory could lead is the unique task, I think, of humanities and historical scholarship and interdisciplinary scholarship. I'm not suggesting we can draw a line of causation from rebellion to today, but we can absolutely historicize and contextualize rhetorical and discursive similarities that we see between these myriad arenas. 
I also think it's a unique task of Islamic study scholars to think through consistencies in the discursive formation of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim rhetoric. The Great Rebellion is a catalyst for the minoritization and racialization of Muslims. And in its wake, Muslims in India emerge permanently differentiated as a result of this both epistemological and physical violence of imperialism. But we should not assume that because the Great Rebellion ended in 1858 that its effects are limited to that year. As I, as I said when I started, no scholar of religion should ignore South Asia in her thinking about how the study of religion has come to be, but similarly, no scholar of religion ought to ignore the role that this rebellion continues to play in the contemporary imagination of Islam and Muslims, particularly in South Asia. It looms in the Indian conceptualization of history and national identity. So for example, in May 2007, India celebrated the 150th anniversary of the Great Rebellion, or rather, it was, as it was memorialized at the time, India's first war of independence. So all of the major newspapers are calling it the first war of independence. Celebrations included performances, marches, some with over 10,000 people involved, art, historical reflection, op-eds in newspapers, and my personal favorite, this float. The British were represented by a giant floating ghoul, is the subtitle. Naming, as you might expect, is political, and marking the sesquicentennial of the rebellion in terms of the first war of independence allowed many, including the then Prime Minister Mamahan Singh, to gloss the rebellion as evidence of a unifying multi-religious India. Such a rhetorical move is political, right? Everyone is one, we all participated in this. In his reflection of, of the commemoration, uh, historian Deepesh Chakrabarti explored the politics of remembering acts of revolt and suggests that commemorations display a tension between celebrating a recurrent date in the life of the nation and that date's representation of a, quote, perpetual incitement to future rebellion. He argues there that, it, that this is an event that is celebrated and eulogized, but is impactful in the act of celebration and eulization. In eulogizing it, that's a word I can't say. It is important because of the ways it's imagined and reinscribed, and I would, I would add that deployed. So one of the places that it gets deployed is in May of 2015, the northern Indian state of Haryana announced it would establish a memorial to the martyrs of the 1857 mutiny at Ambala cantonment. Ambala, like Meirut, Delhi, Kanpur, was an important British stronghold, and as the cantonment section of its city continues to boast, it's a major site of rebellion. So it's still a fortified um, military post. A bumi puja, or a groundbreaking ceremony, was performed as government officials laid the foundation stone on May 11th, one of those mid-May dates I said all the way back at the beginning that kicks off the rebellion. The Hindu, one of India's major newspapers, reported that Haryana's health, sports, and youth affairs minister, Anil Vij, said that establishing this memorial to the martyrs was historic and, quote, future generations would always remember the present government for this important step. The government of Haryana built a memorial to the martyrs of the Great Rebellion that died in its state, timed its foundation to the calendar occurrence of the First Revolt, and offered a pretty heavily coded Hindu groundbreaking ceremony. These are all examples of Chakrabarti's assertion that the memorialization of rebellion is lasting, impactful, and um, present in contemporary India. And as Vij suggests, the minister suggests, the memorialization of the Great Rebellion aimed to serve dual purpose. It would commemorate those lost in the revolts, of course, but would also commit the contemporary government to popular memory as well. This government would be remembered for properly remembering the Great Rebellion. Thinking about how this is coded as Hindu is really important. So the government of Haryana um, establishes a memorial that's cast in religious terminologies, marking martyrs and those remembering them as specifically Hindu. So it marks the memorial, it marks those memorialized, and it marks the cause, in, and it marks the current political states, both Haryana and India, as Hindu. So religion, the religion of Hindus here, is constructed as an example of the religion of the rebels, rebellion, current and future Haryana citizenry. Muslims are notably and problematically absent. And you might think it's a weird way to end a talk on Islam by talking about Hindus, but here's why. We know that Muslims were killed alongside Hindus and Sikhs at Ambala, and we know that demographically speaking, Muslims and Sikhs account for approximately 16% of the city um, based on 2011 data. 
we might rightly expect their numbers are higher pre-partition, which is to say nothing of numbers in the mid-19th century when these areas had been mobile strongholds. The portrayal of the rebels as mar and martyrs as distinctively Hindu is an obvious flip from the portrayal of rebels as distinctively and disturbingly Muslim in the 19th century. Excluding Muslims from the role of rebel in 2017 is just as politicized as uniquely finding them culpable in the mid 19th century. Both are iterations of racialized belonging and both mark Muslims as somehow outside of that particular state. The Muslims, a British imperial category, were marked as foreign, violent, incapable of being subject to non-Muslim rule, and it lingers in this memorialization regardless of who deploys it. The Great Rebellion serves to homogenize and define the two primarily and imperially controlled religious groups of India. As Peter Hardy, a really famous historian, quipped that for British observers in 1857, a Muslim meant a rebel. That sensibility was not confined to 19th century observers. Those who wrote about rebellion wrote its legacy, and in the process, wrote Muslims as jihadi, inherently treasonous subjects to be controlled, surveilled, suspected. Today in India, Muslims are written out of the rebellion by many, not because of Muslims, uh, not because Muslims' racialization, Muslims' role of jihadi didn't take, but because in some Hindu nationalist frameworks, Muslims cannot be a fundamental part of what makes India, India. It is the same idea, racialization tied to articulations of militancy and belonging based on inheritable traits. Islam is not a race, religions are not races, but Muslims are racialized in meaningful, lasting ways after rebellion. There are many routes of definition and routes that those definitions take, and it's clear that the solidification of power by the British over India in the wake of Great Rebellion is one of those roots and routes, roots and routes of, of, of racialization and minoritization of Muslims. Thank you.